Welcome to a brand new episode of 20 Minute Playbook, a show about how the misfits, rebels, and idealists reshaping our world stay at the top of their game. Where each episode, I sit down with an elite performer from iconic founders and CEOs to world renowned investors and New York Times best selling authors, all to dive into everything from their favorite habits, tools, and books to a favorite failure and their definition of success, all in less than 20 minutes. I'm Daniel Scrivener, and on the show today, I sit down with serial entrepreneur Marshall Haas, founder of Need Want Peel and Shepherd. After launching a collection of products from innovative smart bedding to wearable emoji masks with Need Want in 2013, Marshall doubled down on their most successful product. That happened to be insanely thin iPhone cases that they marketed under the name Peel, a business that nearly 10 years later still sells hundreds of thousands of cases a year. His most recent venture is Shepherd, where he helps companies around the world hire the best emerging talent from the Philippines. To learn more about Marshall, visit marshallhaas.com. That's M-A-R-S-H-A-L-L-H-A-A-S.com. And you can also find him on Twitter at Marshall, but this time with one L, so M-A-R-S-H-A-L. For links to everything we cover in this episode, as well as our favorite lessons and takeaways from Marshall, visit outlieracademy.com slash 66. Let's jump in with Marshall Haas, founder of Need Want Peel and Shepherd. Marshall Haas, thank you so much for coming on the show. It's wonderful to have you. Thanks for having me. So this should be a lot of fun. We try to keep these conversations under 20 minutes, so they're a little bit faster paced, and we'll ask you the same 10 questions we ask every guest. Are you ready? Yeah, let's do it. Okay, the first question is, what have you been excited or fascinated about recently? It can be anything. The cabin my wife and I have been building has been super fascinating. It's like the culmination of... I used to want to be an architect. My wife's an interior designer, just love design as a whole and nature. So it's been fun to to dive in and just get the blank slate, get to design something from scratch. Definitely been the most excited for that. And then as we were just talking about before the recording is it's going to be a really fun excuse to invite people I admire out, just like bring five to 10 cool people out and do like a makeshift little event of interesting people. It's going to be my excuse to do that. So yeah, super excited about that. On that project, were you the architect and how deep in the weeds did you get on architecture and design details? So we designed it from like a elevation floor plan side, but then hired an architect to button it all up. There's probably a few little things that we screwed up and then course to build out the remainder we did first two pages floor plan elevation and they did the rest of it <laughs> definitely looped in some professionals you did the fun stuff they make sure it doesn't fall down which right is, you know a good exactly. reason to hire an architect <laughs> <laughs> when you think about yourself what do you think are your superpowers and how have you harnessed those strengths or how do you harness those strengths i think i'm pretty good at bouncing between things and context switching whether that's from just doing it a lot with practice i've gotten good at it all entrepreneurs at some level have ADD as far as like shiny object syndrome and want to start all these different ideas. I think I've just leaned into that and figured out a way to make that work for me, built a model where I get to do that and really try to figure out how to make that work for me. In the early days before when you're figuring out, I think I just had a knack for jumping between very different problems and things. Just given that obviously you you talked about that shiny object syndrome, are there barriers, constraints you put on yourself to try to limit that desire to just go and do everything? Yeah, today there is. I was way less disciplined five, 10 years ago. I mean, I'm still an optimist, but I think I was just like even more so where now I'm way more objective about things. Do I want to even take the time and start a new business. And now I've got this thing that needs to be managed. Honestly, a good example of that very recently, like I killed something off. I was building out what we would do with profits. I was starting to buy rental properties, single family rental homes for long-term tenants and had four properties and one fourplex and percentage return was awesome on paper. You know, I was like pat myself on the back And I track my time still pretty religiously just to see where time's going. And when I finally looked at it, I realized that the time I'm putting into this thing, forget what the return as a percentage of what I invested is, just wasn't worth it. That's a part of want to be more disciplined now. I've got a family and I've been selling them all off and getting out of it completely, putting money elsewhere that I don't have to mess with, less return, but it's a worthy trade-off. Super interesting. It's a great example. 
on the flip side of the coin, what do you feel like you've struggled with? And maybe it's that same thing. And how have you improved or worked around those things over time? But I think for you, if you reflect on your journey, what has felt like the biggest learning curve? I think delegating things. I think I've gotten pretty good at it recently, but it was something I was aware of. At least I had was good enough to know like I want to be good at it, but I was terrible for a very long time. I think the way I fixed it is I took a really conscious approach to it and started studying people that are really good at delegating things. And the other part of it is getting businesses to a point where there was enough profit to be able to hire people and plug them in. So it was like first realizing I shouldn't beat myself up because there wasn't enough money in the business to do that in the first place. Realizing this is a means to an end. So let's get it to this point. Then I can plug in maybe a operations person or something. And then then you track it down far enough down the line is bringing on a general manager or eventually a CEO into something. I think it's the ultimate get there. And we're plugged in general managers into all but one of the businesses. That's all happened very recently too. I've been pretty terrible at it up until recently. So yeah, that's been the key to be able to scale stuff, I think. I'm sure it's been exciting and probably also terrifying. <laughs> yeah. Time. Here's the reins. Yeah. <laughs> when it comes to habits, routines, what habits have you experimented with over time that have had a positive impact on your life and performance? Can be anything from meditation, working out. What have you experimented with? What's worked for you? Yeah. I think just sticking to a regular routine as far as exercise, getting enough hours of sleep in the night, going to bed at a consistent time, waking up at a consistent time and eating healthy, back to basics kind of stuff. By far, has bad had the biggest quality of life improvement and just feeling sharp in everything. And I didn't used to be disciplined when it came to that kind of stuff. Before I got married, I had an artist schedule, sloppy bachelor schedule, however you want to frame it, but just like dive into a problem, 12 hours later, realize I'm moments from death. I need to eat something, stay up all night, sleep in all day, take 24 hours off, see a friend, then go back and all of that. I was terrible at consistency and schedule. And then meeting my now wife and being married, that put some healthy schedule in place. She's quite healthy as well as far as food goes. So that's been good for me. And then becoming a dad as well. I mean, you're up at 6, 7 a.m. every single day. And I've grown to enjoy that that's consistency there in all aspects i just feel sharp for lack of a better word we talked about it a little bit but on the health side what is your approach to diet exercise sleep and how has that evolved over time is there anything novel there or anything you do religiously i used to be one of these people that tracked a lot of different stuff i was in the quantified self movement or whatever and i didn't really see a ton of benefit i realized one day i was like i don't know I'm not changing my habits when it comes to sleep, knowing that I got seven and a half versus eight. I try to just look back and realize like, okay, yeah, I got enough sleep. Good job. And I feel good today. I don't necessarily think I have a good answer for that. I think the one weird thing that I do is I track my time. I'm in an industry, none of our businesses, we bill by the hour or anything like that. But just for me, nobody else in the company, we require to do this. I just track my time. We've got a little harvest app going. I just tag what I'm in. Am I working on Peel? Am I doing like personal finance stuff? Put like opening snail mail and stuff in like miscellaneous. Am I working on the cabin? Just kind of those buckets. And then I'll, I'll look back and one, how much time do I work in a week, in a month, in a year? And then how much time am I putting in each of these businesses? And that honestly, that was the reason why I realized I should sell off those rental properties. So that's the one thing that I do look back on and I do adjust my life based on what I see. Yeah, super interesting. On the idea side, what books and podcasts have had a striking impact on the way you think? And we talked before about some of those early inspirations, like 4-Hour Workweek, Rich Dad, Poor Dad. Is there anything more recent that's really shaped the way you think? I think the only podcast that I really listen to these days is at least consistently. I'll see an interview pop up of someone I like and I'll listen to that or whatever, but is the My First Million podcast from the guys at The Hustle, Sam Parr and Sean Purry, I think is how you say his last name, which if, for those that haven't listened to it, it's just the two of them for the most part riffing on different ideas that they have and then other businesses that they see that pop up through their investing or just being close to Silicon Valley, talking through what they would do. I get so many ideas for my own stuff, for new businesses from that 
it's weird how hearing other people talk about ideas gives you your own ideas. Weird how that you start forming your own stuff as you're listening to someone talk about a totally different idea. That's been fun to flex that idea muscle on a regular basis and just hear how two others think through a lot of different problems and ideas. You're not the first person I know that who really likes that podcast. Oh, yeah. <laughs> it's, a good, it's a fan favorite. On the tool side, we talked a little bit about Harvest. What other tools do you use? And these can be anything. I think things, physical, digital, that you use to manage your work, tasks, time. Yeah. So Peel, we use Basecamp. Shepard, we use Airtable and Slack. Culture of one versus another. They want to use Slack, use Basecamp, whatever. And all company tasks for Peel it's, you know, are in Basecamp. And then the Ludwig is the boutique hotel we touched on. They also use Basecamp. So all company stuff are in those, all that lives there. And then I have like another layer for myself, everything I'm going to do for the day as far as tasks go, whether they're for a certain business or my own personal tasks, pull it out of all those. And I use uh, Todoist, just a really simple task management app. And only I have access to it. My assistant doesn't have access to it. It's just my little area for everything. I'm pretty simple. I use live in email calendar, I do a lot of I message people these days. Todoist has been a favorite of mine personally. I love just the notion, the idea that you can run entire businesses on just basically two tools, <laughs> Basecamp and Slack, Airtable and Slack. There's obviously other things involved, but I mean, I feel like it speaks to the simplicity approach. Yeah, dude. Have you used Airtable? It's awesome. I am a, like addicted to Airtable and I was so against trying it out. And now I use it for everything. And I pay enormous sum every single month when I see the invoice, I like cringe. It's also probably the single most valuable tool that I use. Yeah. It's our database, basically. Customized database for all the candidates that we track for Shepard to team time off and track. It's like you can build so many different things out that I would want to use a developer to spin up our own custom thing. We can get it 80% of the way there with Airtable. It's awesome. I think it's very similar to why Notion has been so successful. Exactly. You've had these companies that have been able to build actually great products that you can use to build almost anything, which is extremely difficult to do. When you think about success, what is your definition of success? And that can be one for business, one for life, just a definition overall. How do you think about that? There's the monetary game side of just money and all that. No denying that's important to me. Building profitable businesses and building wealth is definitely a motivator for me. With that, it's with the asterisk of I want to do that and still have a good family life. You look at guys like... Most recently, Elon Musk is like who everyone is looking at. Guy has a terrible personal... I mean, maybe he's fulfilled. He's been through a lot of divorces and he's at the office living there constantly. I don't want that level of success if it means that's the lifestyle. I'll take... I'm a fraction to his, you know, whatever. That mix of those two, if I have to now take away from being a good dad and a good husband, I don't want any more if that's the trade-off. So... Those two going together well is definitely important to me. Today, I think I touched on this in our last conversation, which the ultimate luxury I think for anyone today is, at least for me, is having a remote position. Whether you have a job or you have a business, being able to do something remotely and having a little bit or a full control of your time, that's everything to me. When you think back on your life, in the previous conversation we had, we talked about some of these things that you tried that you didn't think would work out or that did work out for a while and then didn't. Is there a favorite failure? And I think what we try to look for there is something that didn't work out for whatever reason, but that taught you something valuable, propelled you in a better direction. How do you think about that? And is there something in your mind that sticks out? Yeah, I think the most painful experience gave me a laser focus on what I needed to know for future stuff. And that was the smart betting fiasco with Kickstarter. I was spending an hour of the whole story. We basically did a Kickstarter campaign for an e-commerce product, raise money, use that money to then fund the production. The factory basically goes dark on us. And we're in this horrible in-between position where our customers want the product. They're mad at us, rightfully so. And we want to do it right and deliver and have integrity, but we don't have the funds. And then once we figured that out and had the business going, the margins on that business were quite bad. Both of those really put a spotlight on what's important of how you build a solid business, not betting the farm on any opportunity. 
there was a lot of little things that we shouldn't have done back then that I don't have time to get into. But that business as a whole was very much one where sell something for $2 costs you a dollar to buy more inventory of that same thing. You just couldn't grow with everything. And I've had the fortunate opportunity to see a lot of different businesses and be in a lot of different businesses. I've realized, oh, it's a lot easier over here to do this other thing if you set it up correctly. So yeah, I think I learned some pivotal lessons there around margin, solving long-term problems and what does and doesn't matter as well. There's so many things that we do in business that you could not do it and it wouldn't affect anyone. You could stop doing it and nobody would complain as far as your customers. They would get the same deliverables and nothing changes. And so all those different things I rattled off there to me have been huge lessons that I've applied to everything since that I've done. Yeah. Super interesting. Last question. What are you most grateful for in this phase of your life? I think touched on it, which is the balance I'm super happy where I'm at financially, but with the balance of the family life and having time to, my kids right outside my office door, when I'm, we're done with this, I'll get to go hang out with them for 30 minutes or, you know, however long before he goes next nap and dive back into some work, that balance there and, and being able to see my family and be a dad and be able to take off if I need to for his doctor's appointment or one day of his baseball game or whatever. I'm super, super grateful for, and I do not take for granted. I try to protect that at all costs. It's a beautiful way to end the interview. Thank you so much for the time, Marshall. This has been an incredible conversation. Yeah, thanks, man. Thank you so much for listening. You can find links to everything that we discussed, as well as the show notes and transcript for this episode at outlieracademy.com slash 66. For more from Marshall, listen to our in-depth conversation all about the lessons he's learned as the serial entrepreneur behind Need, Want, Peel, and Shepherd in episode 65. And visit outlieracademy.com to explore more incredible interviews with the founders of Rally, Titan, Superhuman, and Primal Kitchen, as well as New York Times bestselling authors and many of the world's smartest investors. From our entire team at Outlier Academy, we hope you enjoyed the show. I hope to see you right here next week on 20 Minute Playbook.